Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble. In the left corner, weighing in at 100 pounds soaking wet, is a man with 47 years in politics, but with zero major wins under his belt. Known for his affinity for smelling people's body odor and word salading his way through hundreds of interviews over the last year and a half, this man has the tenacity necessary to at least sort of know what he's doing. He may not know where he is half the time, but everything aside from the dead, blackened look in his eyes is pretty good at pretending. Give it up for Sniffy Joe. And in the right corner, weighing in at the undisclosed hundreds is a tan Tangerine who needs no introduction. With the biggest W possible in his political resume and a whopping kill count of over 200,000, this fighter's silver tongue is ripe for the pricking. His country may be burning, but his spunk is at least reassuring for a few superficial moments. Here's our Cheeto-in-Chief, Donald Tangerine Jesus Drumpf. Over the course of the next few weeks, these two will be going head-to-head -head on various debate stages in order to win over the hearts and minds of the American people. And while it may seem like a moot point to the uncultured masses that have already made up their minds, what they don't understand is that if there's anything a boomer loves more than fucking the next generation, it's self-fellating on live TV. And boy oh boy, was there a lot of elderly fellatio to be had. Because on three nights, two old men will fight for the acceptance of one nation. Welcome to the political pissing party, round one. The night started off about as well as you could imagine. There was limited seating at the event due to the current COVID-19 pandemic, and a lack of applause due to debate changes made to make it so Trump couldn't win. I mean, to make it so that everyone could play fair and not mercilessly attack one another for no good reason. Although speaking of which, it wasn't Trump to draw first blood. Instead, as moderator Chris Wallace introduced the presidential candidates and had them step onto the stage, Joe was the first one to deliver a blow. How you doing, man? Now, whether this statement came out because Joe wanted to appear friendly or he forgot Trump was his sworn mortal enemy remains to be seen, but nonetheless, the debate kicked off with both sides being allowed two minutes to answer a question each, followed by a designated 11 minutes of no use from each candidate. There were to be six topics, but God knows what they were supposed to be, considering the entire debate devolved into an ever-illustrious shit show, the likes of which I have never seen before. And this is coming from someone who saw everything to do with the 2016 election. Holy shit, have we never had a more incredibly tedious and annoying debate in the history of our nation. Oh, I'm staking the claim right here, right now. There has never been a single debate worse than this one. Not a single political discussion that has taken place to make me realize just how fucked we are come November. For something that's only a month away, it seriously feels like it's decades off, given how much shit we still have to trek through before we get there. But trek we must, even if it means we have to get down and dirty with the worst of the worst. We might as well start, seeing as I've kept you waiting in suspense for long enough. But where to even begin? It was the same shit over and over. Biden and Trump would answer questions, occasionally trying to interrupt each other in the process, while Wallace tried to quell the storm in the 11 allotted minutes for chaotic destruction because Trump was winning too hard. After all, we wouldn't want to see an Alzheimer's patient be knocked around too hard on live TV now, would we? Although it was pretty clear given Joe's performance that he wasn't too big on all the interruptions Trump kept annoyingly vocalizing. The question Supreme is, Justice, the radical question, left, will you who shut is up, on, man. Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This Who's is on your so list? Right. Gentlemen, is, I think this we've is ended so this. He's going to pack the court. We have end, no, no. Not give a list. We have ended this segment. We're going to move on to the second segment. That was really a pr productive segment, wasn't it? Keep yapping, man. The and it was pretty much this for an hour and a half. Just two toddlers in the bodies of grown adult men having a Twitter tier slap fight over which one of them would be taking over the duty of thrusting that crusty dildo into the ass of the working class. But of course, there were some key memorable moments. Well, we'll get back to this topic closer to the end of the video. The discussion about COVID was pretty funny, especially considering Trump wanted the country to open back up despite most states barely ever following protocol in the early days anyway, leading to the increased number of cases we're now seeing. But but hey, at least Donnie was able to bring everyone's favorite sports ball game back to the television. They brought back football. By the way, I brought back Big Ten <laughs> football. It was me, and it, I'm very happy to do it. And All right, people let's, of let's, Ohio let's, are very proud of me. And you know we're how get I back. that? When we're, took gentlemen, we're gonna get Although what he wasn't able to bring was a good answer to something that came up a few days prior to the debate. This was the New York Times report revealing that in 2016 and 2017, Trump only paid $750 per year on his personal income in taxes. This doesn't include business expenses, of course, so we don't have a way of really knowing just how much the Trump brand had to fork over to the IRS. But that doesn't really change the impression I got watching Trump try and dance around the question of just how much money he paid. Will you tell us how much you paid in federal income taxes 
in 2016 and 2017. Millions of dollars. You paid millions of dollars? Millions in, of dollars, So yes. not 700 Millions of dollars, and you'll get to see I, it. I, and you'll get to when? see it. But and let me Shalom? just tell you, Chris, let me just tell you something, that it was the tax laws. I don't want to pay tax. Be before I came here, I was a private developer. I was a private business people. Like every other private person, unless they're stupid, they go through the laws, and that's what it is. Well, there you have it. The New York Times were just reporting fake news, using fictionalized facts in order to swing the election towards Sniffy Joe and the Demo Bros. And we know this because Trump, a billionaire who hasn't released his tax returns, told us so. See, now who wouldn't put their faith in the very big hands of a very big orange? But hey, given that the news was fraudulent and Trump is very adamant about that, I guess there's no reason at all not to release your tax returns, huh, Donnie? You're not afraid to give the real numbers to the American people you're representing now, are you? No, no, of course he isn't. He's Dolan Brumph. He knows what he's doing, and he would never lie to anyone. Well, except for when he tried to downplay COVID at first and doubled down on said plane, well, thousands of old people started dropping dead. But hey, we all make whoopsies sometimes. After all, we've all done something silly for a friend before, right? But the point is that Donald didn't do too great a job deflecting questions about his tax returns, mostly because he couldn't know you, Joe, about them because, well, he did release his tax returns. So Joe kind of won out in that regard. Even so, Trump did get a few good zingers in throughout. This one is my personal favorite of the night. We have the highest defi trade deficit China with ate Mexico. Your lunch. All right, ate gentlemen, percent. In, in, China in. ate your lunch, Joe. But other than that, he was stifled considerably by Chris Wallace, the moderator, who kept telling Trump to not interrupt Joe every chance he got. And boy, oh boy, did those discussions get heated. Yeah. Mr. Vice he got three Mr. And a half President, dollars. that is not true. Oh, really, Mr. Oh. President, but, Mr. You, it's, a, it's an open discussion, please. Now, you, you, it's a fact. I, well, there's, you have raised an issue. Let the Vice totally President answer. This crazy. All right, right that's, the end of the, uh, that's the end of the Shouldn't segment. We're, mov money. we're moving on. There's, he didn't take them. Well, Vice President, Chris, no. I, can I be honest? It's a very important try to be honest. He stood up. No, I, I, the answer to the question is no. Ukraine. No, I, sir. With a billion sir, dollars, if you that don't get rid of the you know what? You're wait, not stop. true. And sadly, that was most of the debate. Just Wallace yelling at Trump, telling him to stop saying funny things like how Joe graduated last in his class in college, or messing Biden up on what point he was on while he was talking. Yeah, but, but because what he did, even before COVID, manufacturing went in the hole. Manufacturing went in a hole. Excuse number me, one. Chris. Wait. Number two. Chris. Number three. They said they, it would take. They, no, you're number two. No. Chris. Is Trump an asshole? Yes. But he's also very entertaining when he needs to be. And who doesn't love a good shit show? I think things really started getting bad for Trump, though, when he started saying things that the media would latch onto as soon as the sun rose the next morning. That being that Trump refused to denounce white supremacy on account of stating that most of the city burnings were being done by left-wing associates. His statements would later garner this quote from him after he was asked to specifically denounce the Proud Boys. Sure, Are you I'm prepared willing to, to do specifically that, but do it? Well, I, go would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right so wing. So what are you, what are you, you look, what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call him? What do you want to call him? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and right wing. Who would you like me to condemn? White proud proud supremacists boys. and right proud proud boys. Boys. Stand back and stand by. Stand the fuck back indeed. Outside of the debate and over the course of the next few days, the Proud Boys would end up using this as a slogan of their own. This led to an increased popularity for them on cesspits like Twitter, where the hashtag Proud Boys started trending. Only instead of trending because of the group, the name was co-opted by gay people who were standing in solidarity against white supremacy in order to show those dastardly Proud Boys who's boss. Little do they realize, however, that the Proud Boys founder, Gavin McInnes, is something of a gay icon on himself, as on his show roughly two years ago, he decided to, I shit you not, own the libs by sticking a butt plug up his ass to prove that he doesn't hate gay people. Truly, Mr. McInnes is the proudest of boys and the greatest savior of Western civilization this world has ever known. Barring this comment from Trump, though, the rest of his performance in the debate was overshadowed by a moderator trying to shut him up. And at some points, I will admit, it was frustrating that Joe couldn't get a word in edgewise over him. At the same time, though, two candidates going at each other would have made it a lot more fun to watch. 
Problem is, though, Joe wasn't about making it entertaining and was taking the whole night way too seriously. At the very least, Trump knew how to have fun. At the same time, I'm willing to admit that his behavior wasn't too good a look for anyone who gives a shit about politics outside of laughing at everyone for doing dumb shit. Because there really weren't any major policies outlined through his answers to questions, something that Joe was able to do much better than him, albeit dryly and not with the same amount of consistency as Trump had bouncing him across the stage. But Biden was still able to make a few solid points. For one, he decided to bravely go where no Democrat had gone before, and pretty much denounced the violence rioters were creating in larger cities, proposing that people need to come together in order to find a solution to racism. There's, a, there's a systemic injustice in this country, in education, in work, and in, in, in law enforcement, and in the, in the way in which it's enforced. But look, the vast majority of police officers are good, decent, honorable men and women. They risk their lives every day to take care of us. But there are some bad apples. And when they occur, when they find them, they have to be sorted out. They have to be held accountable. They have to be held accountable. And what I'm going to do as President of the United States is call a, a, together an entire group of people at the White House, well, everything from the civil rights groups to the police officers, to the police chiefs, and we're going to work this out. We're going to work this out so we change the way in which we have more transparency in when these things happen. It's an admirable gesture to be sure. At the same time though, Biden's true emotions about his fellow Democrats also leaked out on that night. Not emotions I really blame him for, but emotions that still may not look so good in the eyes of an ever left-leaning party. Economy and about this question of what it's going to cost. The, the economy. The econ I mean the Green New Deal the, and the, the idea of what, what the, your the environmental changes deal, will do. The Green New Deal will pay for itself as we move forward. We're not going to build plants that, in fact, are great polluting plants. Do you We're support the Green New Deal? P pardon me? You support No, I don't support the Green oh, New Deal. Oh, you don't? Oh, well, well that's a big not... statement. I support that means you the just lost the radical left. I, su gun. I support oh, the don't. Biden plan. Not a big fan of the Green New Deal, I see. But wait a minute. What's this little blurb I found on JoeBiden.com? Biden believes the Green New Deal is a crucial framework for meeting the climate challenges we face. Well, that didn't seem to be the case when Trump was grilling you on it last night. Seems someone forgot the rhetoric his handlers were feeding him and will probably have to backtrack at some point if he hasn't done so already. At the very least, Trump isn't on a leash that he has to make sure doesn't tug too tight when he says something. Or at least the leash is so long it's too busy being dragged by the currents in the Atlantic if you catch my drift. As for Biden, maybe he really doesn't like the Green New Deal, and this is just a subtle amount of red-pilled belief eking its way into the spotlight. I suppose only time will tell. But aside from his wins, much like Trump, he too suffered some damning losses. Although I do have to admit that his blunders seem to do a lot more damage than Trump's. Not really because they were worse, but because he's fighting in a party that's losing popularity with the American people and doesn't have current control of the Oval Office. So what, pray tell, does Joe decide to do when on the topic of getting a new justice to replace the color spectrum? He just, well, tells people to vote? The issue is the American people should speak. You should go out and vote. You're in voting now. Vote and let your senators know how you strongly you feel. Court? Let Vote now. Are you gonna pack the Make court? sure you, in fact, let people know he you're a senator. I'm not going to answer the question Why because, you answer that because question? the you question is, the question Supreme is, just no, this has nothing to do with the question being asked. And yes, the desperation on his face is horrendous. But what I like the most about this clip is how well it illustrates Biden's entire platform throughout the debate that night. The whole time, Biden straight up refused to look at Trump. I honestly can't tell if this was a Chad move on his part or if it's the most cringe act of subtlety I've ever seen on stage. Although probably not as cringe as some of the other shit Biden decided to say while he was on stage. Because while his prior statements about coming together and the Green New Deal had their own level of interest to them, there was one thing he said that's sure to do anything but make the people on his side of the fence side with him. Are you in favor of law and order? I'm in favor of law. You follow Are you in favor of law and order? Go ahead, Simon. You ask a question, let him finish. Law and order. Let him in. Law and order with justice where people get treated fairly. Uh, not exactly what people are looking for anymore, Joe. Because if the internet has any commentary to offer, it's that supporting cops isn't really on the top of anyone's lists right now. Sure, it's obvious to anyone with a functioning brain that not everyone on one side of an argument is a villain. But the people you're trying to please aren't really capable of seeing things from perspective other than their own. So when you decide, in your infinite wisdom, to start appealing to the police, when you start saying anything that could be construed as remotely in line with views perpetuated by law enforcement, views perpetuated by bootlickers, 
you aren't really doing yourself any favors in getting elected. Now, of course, the alternative is Trump, so anyone on your side is going to vote blue no matter who. But that doesn't really mean they're going to agree with everything you say, and it'll only result in more pushback from screeching crazy people. But hey, I'm sure that's something you'll be able to handle just fine. After all, it's not like you're a forgetful old man who is one bad day away from handing the presidential nomination over to Kamala. <laughs> Wait a minute, my mistake. Though there was one other thing that Joe said when trying to defend mail-in ballots after Trump claimed officials were dumping them in rivers instead of sending them to post offices. Vice President Biden, the biggest problem, in fact, over the years with mail-in voting has not been fraud historically. It has been that sizable numbers, sometimes hundreds of thousands of ballots are thrown out because they have not been properly filled out or there is some other irregularity or they missed the deadline. So the question I have is, are you concerned that the Supreme Court with a Justice Barrett will settle any dispute. I'm concerned that any court would settle this because here's the deal. When you, when you file, when you get a ballot and you fill it out, you're supposed to have an affidavit. If you didn't know, you have someone say that this is me. You should be able to, if in fact you can verify that's you when the before the ballot is thrown out. Wow, Joe. Great job quelling Republican fears about the legitimacy of vote by mail. I'm sure that them hearing their vote might be thrown out if they do one thing wrong really makes them reconsider their conspiracies about election corruption. I'm sorry, Joe, but aren't you trying to win? Like, get the nomination so Trump doesn't keep cutting taxes for big businesses and sit on his hands while fever and fire burn America to ashes? Because right now, you're not doing a very good job at convincing anyone, either undecided or right-leaning, that you're good enough for the job. Sure, there will probably be a plethora of people who vote for you because they're sick of seeing Orange Man roll onto their TV screens and Facebook feeds every hour. But are those people really there to support you or to get rid of Trump? And that seemed to be the biggest flaw with this first debate. It wasn't about the policies each person had and wanted to shape the country with. It wasn't about trying to bolster the idea of Americans coming together under one banner, whether begrudgingly or not. It wasn't even about us, the people whose next four years of economic livelihood is going to be decided by one of these wrinkly raisins. Instead, it was about finding the most surefire way to tear each other apart like it was some kind of WWE match. Which, don't get me wrong, was entertaining, but was also a sign of things to come. A sign that whichever one of these dumb motherfuckers ends up in the White House a few months from now is going to ensure that the majority of Americans are bleeding by the time they're done, assuming there's anything left of our corpses to even bleed out. America is fucked, and it's only a matter of time before we find out which one of these two will be doing the fucking. But it doesn't have to be either of them. As you can see by this picture which originated from my video on the third Democratic debate, there is still a third candidate you can choose to write in. Three, actually, who you can contribute a vote toward in this upcoming election. The trifecta perfecta. Instead of siding with a 3D boomer with a 2D personality, come to the side of 2D cuties with 3D ambitions. The ambition to make the world a better place through their election. I've said it before, but I have no problem ending this video the same as that one oh so long ago. It ain't worth living your life, ooh, if your country ain't run by a waifu. When needed, I wear masks. Okay, let me ask. I don't have, to, I don't wear masks like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking 200 feet away from it, he shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. 